much has been made of the United States as being different from its European predecessors, whether Great Britain, France, Spain, and myriad other European nations, in that the United States never possessed an empire. Well, if any of you have taken the first half of this U.S. history course, either with me or another professor, or even maybe you've heard of this in high school, one of the reasons why the United States never had to create a, an external empire is because it was blessed with a tremendous amount of land. So whereas the United States did not go abroad looking to create an empire, it did move westward from its earliest origins on the eastern seaboard of the United States during the Revolutionary Era all the way out to the west coast through the gold rush of the 1840s and various other events in that period of US history. So what we're gonna be talking about today though is the massive movement of people and goods out to those areas. And we're here talking about transcontinental expansion. But we're also gonna be talking about, not too much here in this lecture, but even more so in one of the documents that you have for this class, and that is the fears that spring up at this time in US history, in the late 19th century, the 1890s. And these fears are really shown in an article that is presented by a historian, Frederick Jackson Turner. Frederick Jackson Turner was a, a, a supreme figure in the historical profession. And he gave a speech in the early 1890s, which you will be reading an excerpt from. And he warns that by the early 1890s, the frontier of the United States is closed. Well, that will have reverberations for the United States and particularly its interactions with the globe, as we will see in later classes this semester. But nonetheless, for this point now, we're gonna simply talk about the movement and goods of people westward and the roadblocks and impediments that they face on their movements out west. I wanna start this class by looking at this image here. This comes from Harper's Weekly, and I want you to pay particular attention to the date, May of 1865. So this is right at that moment when the United States is coming out of the deadliest wars in its history, the Civil War. And what we see in this image here is rather than being content to have a period of rest and relaxation, we see this political cartoon showing the interests of leaders in the United States. So I wanna talk briefly what this image shows here. So obviously at the forefront of this cartoon is the character and figure of Uncle Sam. Well, just as importantly, is what he is holding in his hands. And what he is holding in his hands is of course a large American flag. But here's the interesting point, a couple of things as we move back further in the background there. Who is holding that flag? Well, you can sort of see by the headdress of these figures, it appears that they are Native Americans. And this flag is being stretched all the way across the continental United States. But also prefiguring and suggesting what is gonna happen in the future, we also see this flag extending beyond the continental United States into the waters. And if you notice far back in this image, two important pieces that sort of highlight what we're gonna be talking about in future lectures. First of all, you see a steamship, and that can come to represent a number of different things. Does it mean it's a military boat? Does it mean it's a trade vessel? whatever, it means that the American ideals and America itself is expanding into the oceans. And we also see the sun in the background, sort of smiling, looking fondly at all of this that is going on. So in short, what we're seeing here already in 1865, despite America as a nation still having to reunite and repair itself, already looking to what comes next. And what comes next is westward expansion. Let's talk about how this westward expansion occurred. Now, one of the things that I want to highlight, and we're gonna see this over the next couple slides in this lecture, is just how much the government plays a role, the federal government plays a role in this movement westward 
by normal everyday Americans. And we see it even again as the Civil War is raging primarily along the eastern half of the United States. In 1862, Congress passed the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act enabled male American citizens to acquire 160 acre plots of land that were owned by the federal government. Now these plots of lands would be, would be used to build houses, farms, and then obviously allow for agriculture to thrive and grow in this area. Well, after a five year period in which they took this 160 acre plot of land, individual settlers would be able to obtain the title to the land. Well, as a result of this 1862 Homestead Act, hundreds of thousands of families obtained land in the Western United States. But interestingly enough, the majority of settlers in the West did not get their lands from the federal government, but rather purchased land from speculators and railroad companies. You would have whites from the East, blacks from the South, and immigrants from Canada, Germany, Scandinavia, and Great Britain settling in the West. Now, just to show you how diverse this crowd was that was moving west, if I were to ask you, by the late 19th century, what was the most ethnically diverse state in the Union, a lot of you might be prone to say New York. Why? Well, a lot of you would probably be thinking, obviously, that's a main embarkation point for a lot of immigrants coming over from Europe. And while that is true, and while a lot of those immigrants settled in the major urban centers in the East Coast, whether New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, what you will see is that by the late 19th century, North Dakota was actually the most ethnically diverse state in the Union. So here we are seeing again a wide variety of people. And as a result, as more and more people move out west, you're going to see a massive spike in the number of farms in this region. As you can see on the screen, Kansas alone, the state of Kansas alone, had just 10,000 farms in 1860. By 1880, just 20 years later, there would be at least 239,000 farms. But here's the thing I wanna highlight about this area, and you see it a little in the Frederick Jackson Turner document, how he, how he describes why the West is good. And one of the reasons he says the West is good is because it requires ingenuity out of the people who are living out there. And what he meant by this was the fact that it was extremely rough living. The winters were sometimes harsh out there. The land often lacked trees. So therefore many settlers, as you see on the image here on the right, were forced to live in these sod houses. Now some of these were quite lavish, but nonetheless, it was hard living. These were people who were isolated on these large plots of land. They didn't have a lot of entertainment. They didn't have a lot of interactions with other friends and definitely not with their family members outside of their immediate household. So clearly this was a tough, tough life to live for these migrants westward. As the government was providing hundreds of thousands of acres of land and private speculators were selling even more to these settlers moving west, they obviously had to get there. Now, even before this period in U.S. history, a lot of people took the land-based trails. Uh, a lot of you have probably played, maybe not as many as used to, but if you've ever played the Oregon Trail, uh, the video game, a computer game, and this, this tough, hard life as they were moving westward before they even actually had to get out there, just how difficult it was. But that wasn't the only way, because what we also see in 1862 is the government again putting a lot of money into the creation of additional miles of railroad. So it becomes far easier and much faster to get out west because of this, as I have the title of this screen, the revolution on the rails. Prior to the Civil War, Railroads were built only after people had settled in the region, and it was determined that there was enough business to make the railroad companies money. These the same railroad companies were unwilling to bear the expenses of building railroads in the West. So as we see here, and as we'll see throughout US history, when there is not enough profit motive for these private corporations to do something, the federal government has to step in and sort of loosen the gears and oil the gears with money. 
and that is in fact what happens because in 1862 the federal government stepped in when Congress passed the Pacific Railroad Acts. The Pacific Railroad Acts were a series of acts passed by Congress that promoted the construction of what became known as the Transcontinental Railroad and it did this by offering government bonds and land to entrepreneurs willing to build in the West. These government bonds were sometimes massive. How so? Well, here's what it was. These government bonds ranged from $16,000 to $18,000, and they were given for each mile of track that was laid in the West. Between 1850 and 1871, railroad companies received more than 175 million acres of public land at no cost. So this is a huge boom for these private industries that were previously reluctant to build railroads. Now they're getting both land and money from the federal government. So as a result of this, we see a massive growth in the mileage of railroads being built in the United States. Between 1850 and 1871, railroad companies, like I said, received 175,000 acres of public land. So as a result of this, we would see in 1850, when there was just 9,000 miles of railroad, by 1900, there would be 190,000 miles of railroad. So as this was going on, we see the pivotal support of the Republican Party. And I wanted to do a brief detour here to explain why. So we've already talked about the Republican Party during Reconstruction, and they believed that a strong government was needed to protect the rights of the freed slaves and to ensure equal citizenship for all Americans. Well, the Republican Party led the effort to fund the expansion of the railroads because it wanted to open the lands to settlers. And this would allow the white yeoman farmers that were the backbone of the Republican Party to move out west and get these lands. Furthermore, these lands in the Republican mindset allowed for the extraction of resources and in the west. And furthermore, these resources and along with other goods could then be traded with markets in China and Asia. And these goods could be shipped back and forth between those Asian markets in the East Coast factories in the United States. So as a result of all these efforts, we have an event on May 10th, 1869, which is encapsulated in the photo on the right. And that was when the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. The Central Pacific originated in California, met the Union Pacific coming from the Missouri River. And this image here is in Promontory Point in Utah. Now, one thing I want to talk about, primary sources. A big thing you need to pay attention for is bias in these primary sources that you're reading this semester. And we see that here in this image as well. There's a lot of celebration going on there, but when we look at this image closely, and if we know something about the construction of these railroads, we'll know one thing is a glaring issue with this photo. And that is the fact that it is it ignores the labor of the Chinese, the Chinese immigrants who were main players and main workers in the building of the Transcontinental Railroad are no longer to be see, are nowhere to be seen on this image. I talked in the last slide and gave and quantified the growth of railroads, but now what I want to do is actually give you a visualization of this growth in the amount of railroads in the United States. So we see these dark reddish maroon color lines. Those were railroads in operation in 1840. And not surprisingly, those railroad lines were primarily along the eastern seaboard of the United States, where the earliest industrialization took place and the growth of these major urban centers, New York. You'll also see them obviously along the Great Lakes, the eastern Great Lakes, as you can see there, Lake Erie. Why? Because we have what was in the mid 20th century, actually earlier than the mid 20th century, we see the creation of canals which connected these lakes to various regions and the canals will eventually be replaced or 
added on to the railroads as kind of pieces to this trade that is growing in the northeastern and midwestern United States. Well, the light blue lines represent railroads in operation in 1870. And what we see is not surprisingly a movement westward. But the majority here again is near those major hubs. So whereas the dark red lines were centered around New York City, the blue lines are centered around Chicago, which becomes the hub of the Midwest. And we also see a lot of blue lines out to Kansas City, which is sort of the hub of the Great Plains region. But we also see these blue lines moving further and further south, particularly to New Orleans. And we see it as well in the southeastern United States. But that leaves a whole half of the country that by 1870 is still lacking access to the railroads, with the exception, of course, of the Transcontinental Railroad, as you can see, connecting San Francisco to the west, to the Mideast, or to the Midwest, and eventually to the east. However, by 1920, as you can see by the yellowish-orange lines, you will have myriad railroads reaching the west coast. So this is clearly indicative of this growing prevalence of the railroads in the United States. As this movement westward was going on, you had a lot of people seeking to defend what the United States was doing, this westward expansion. And a lot of these ideas are essentially repeats of earlier arguments made in the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s when an idea of manifest destiny sprung up to defend westward expansion back in that era. And manifest destiny essentially means, and it's the belief that the United States has received the approval of God to spread its ideals across the land to help civilize humanity. And we see that here in this image across the continent. And this is a really indicative of the mindset that a lot of Americans are holding as more and more of these same Americans were moving westward. Obviously at the center of this image is the steam powered locomotive engine in the train. But along with that, we have civilization as represented in the building of houses, the public school at the forefront of this image. So as these people are moving westward, these settlers are moving westward, as you can see in the bottom left hand corner, they are taking down nature. They are removing the savage, barbarian, empty wilderness and replacing it with humanity and civilization here. You still see some of the, the covered wagons of people, settlers who were moving westward that way. But you also see in this image another indicator of progress and civilization. And that is the telegraph lines, which are strung up and down and along the railroad tracks. But look at how this image is divided as well, because you can clearly see on one hand, you have civilization, which is closer to us, the viewer, farther out is the wilderness. But as you can also see way out in the wilderness, look at those covered wagons. They are sort of the head marchers, the leaders moving into the West slowly bringing progress and civilization to this region, followed by the train, followed by the houses, the schools, the families, and the farmers. But you also have to pay attention to another group that is represented in this image that we're going to talk a lot more about here in a couple seconds, and that is on the bottom right hand of your corner of your screen. You see the Native Americans on their horses. It looks like they have some sort of sticks or possibly weapons but they're almost looking in awe at what is before them. Almost like they're being overtaken by this monumental mass of humanity, progress, and civilization. Whereas it looks like they have no chance of defeating this mammoth movement westward. So let's look at these Native Americans who in the minds of many Americans were portrayed as standing in the way of progress. As the workers began construction on the Transcontinental Railroad, they encountered Native Americans. 
like they had in other areas of the railroad business, the federal government would once again step in, this time by providing soldiers to protect the railroad workers. While the presence of the workers and the U.S. military only increased the already volatile region. These tensions would eventually explode in 1864. In November of that year, the U.S. military attacked the Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians at Sand Creek in Colorado, despite the fact that the tribal chief there waved his flag of surrender. 200 Cheyenne Indians were massacred, two-thirds of which were women and children. The U.S. government would also use a different approach to deal with Native Americans. And this approach was treaties, as they had done throughout history. If violence didn't work, sign a treaty with the Native Americans to get their lands that way. Well, in October of 1867, the Treaty of Medicine Lodge was signed at Medicine Lodge, Kansas. It stipulated that the Kiowa, the Comanche, the Apache, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho Indians would give up their claim to 90 million acres of land in the Plains region. Here's the key part though. In return for that 90 million acres of land, they would receive a 3 million acre reservation in present day Oklahoma. So clearly an imbalance here. Give up 90 million acres and in return receive just 3 million acres in present day Oklahoma. Well, the following year, the Sioux and Arapaho tribal leaders from the Northern Plains reached an agreement with the United States government. This 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie created the Great Sioux Reservation in North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Nebraska. Some Indian chiefs, including Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, however, did not agree with this agreement between the U.S. government and the various tribes of the Northern Plains. Within a year, however, Northern Pacific Railroad crews were surveying these lands. To make matters worse for these Native Americans, gold would eventually be discovered in the Black Hills of South Dakota. After an initial offer to purchase the Black Hills, the federal government demanded that the Sioux move to the Pine Ridge Reservation, which they refused to do. Therefore, the government sent in George Armstrong Custer to attack the recalcitrant Indians but these Indians, under the leadership of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, defeated Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. In the end, however, not surprisingly based on the massive, powerful military of the U.S. government, the United States obtained the Black Hills and forced the Sioux onto the Pine Ridge Reservation. Crazy Horse would eventually be captured in 1877 and killed. Sitting Bull surrendered in 1881. The, this battle of Little Bighorn was just one of many skirmishes. As you can see, there were dozens upon dozens of battles, massacres, and forts, military forts set up to carry out these attacks on the Indians. And we can see this all on the map to the right. We've talked about the Indian Wars. We've talked about the treaties used by the federal government. Both were tools meant to take these lands away from Native Americans. But as we saw, both of these methods led to a lot of anger, understandably, among these Native American tribes. So therefore, throughout the 1870s and 1880s, the United States would try several other approaches that was meant to, in the words of Richard H. Pratt, the Carlisle Indian School leader, to kill the Indian and save the man. Now, as you see, as you saw or will see in the document by Pratt, he didn't mean physically killing these Native Americans, but rather destroying their native traditions and their native thinking and their native customs. And the primary means to accomplish this goal was through the creation of these Indian schools. In 1877, Congress agreed to set aside money for Indian education. The following year, 1878, the Hampton Institute in Virginia, a school that was inter interestingly enough meant for former slaves to learn technical trade sc uh, skills, enrolled several Indian students, 
Indian children, once they were in the school, were stripped not only of their clothing and belongings, but also their Indian names. So what we will have is like this image on the right, where on the left, these three individuals, these three children, these three Native children are clearly Native Americans. In the right, they, that those aspects of their life and livelihood are de-emphasized. They are Americanized. They are Europeanized to make them look like Anglo-Saxon Americans and fit into American society. Well, the Hampton Institute in Virginia would eventually not meet the needs of the U.S. government. So therefore, in 1879, the Carlisle Indian School was formed in Pennsylvania, and this would serve as the primary model for other Indian schools throughout America. Why did U.S. officials support these boarding schools? Well, primarily because after government officials did a cost-benefit analysis, they determined that it, these boarding schools would save the federal government money. As Carl Schurz, the Secretary of the Interior, said in 1881, we are told that it costs little less than a million dollars to kill an Indian in war. It costs about $150 a year to educate one at Hampton or Carlisle. So just the, the bare brutality of this statement, all in a very much unemotional language saying it's economically better for the U.S. government to save the man, but to kill the Indian, not physically again, but in the manner that will allow the Americanization and civilizing, the so-called Americanization and civilizing of these Native Americans. What was life like in boarding school for these Native American children who were torn away from their families and their tribes? Well, for half the day, boys were taught how to farm and do manual labor, such as carpentry, while the girls were forced to learn domestic duties. So you see right from the start here, we have this effort to make these female and male Native Americans act like European models, European gender models, I should say. The men do the manly tasks, the females do the more Gentile domestic tasks. And we can see this on this image from the right, from Oregon, an Indian training school there, where the women are told how to make pastries, how to sew, how to tailor, how to do laundry. In Indian society, women were given a lot of different responsibilities, both inside the home and outside the home. This was a far cry from what we would see in these boarding schools, where again, these boarding schools were trying to domesticate the women and circumscribe their activities and force them to do the homes that will, to do the work in the homes as was expected of American women during this time. Well, the other half of the day after the women and men were trained to fill out their genderized roles, we see the other half of the day being spent in intensive English classes as well as classes in math, physiology, geography, and US history. The children are also sent out into surrounding communities on what were known as outings. And these outings allowed them to interact with whites, but most ended up simply serving as unpaid labor. In 1928, decades, almost a half century after these boarding schools were created, the Rockefeller Foundation funded a study of the boarding schools. And this study was known as the Miriam Report. And it's found the following, and I want to read this quote in whole because it really gets at to what was going on in these boarding schools. In nearly every boarding school, one will find children of 10, 11, and 12 spending four hours a day in more or less heavy industrial work, dairy, kitchen, work, laundry, shop, the report's authors wrote. Another direct quote, the work is bad for children of this age, especially children not physically well-nourished. Most of it is in no sense educational. At present, the half-day plan is felt to be necessary, not because it can be defended on health or educational grounds, for it cannot, but because the small amount of money allowed for food and clothes makes it necessary to use child labor. So all of this heightened rhetoric of how great these boarding schools were for these Native American children, helping them adapt to American ways of life. Well, as we're seeing here, in fact, it was much worse. 
they were not only stripped of their native customs and beliefs and their their commonalities but they were also forced to do these things against their will just to earn a living and to help others profit with this child labor what i want to turn to now is another effort by the federal government to strip native americans of their land and that was something that Congress passed in 1887, known as the Dawes Severality Act, also known as the Dawes Allotment Act, and more simply known as the Dawes Act of 1887. And this, by ending the reservation system, sought an end to communal ownership. It sought the growth in the number of farmer Indians. It sought greater interactions between Indians and whites. And finally, it aimed to make so-called surplus Indian lands available for sale. So you're gonna be reading a document this week for this class about how the government wanted to basically use this Dawes Act to civilize and Americanize the Indian. And the document provides various examples of how such an act would do that and why it was necessary. So the Dawes Act, we know what its intentions were but now let's talk about what it actually did and how it aimed to carry out what I just talked about briefly a couple seconds ago. The Dawes Act included four provisions. First of all, 160 acre allotments of land would be made available to heads of families. Now here's the key thing here, heads of families, because what the Dawes Act was attempting to do was to break apart the tribes and make them into the so-called nuclear family where you have a man, a wife, and their children. That's why these 160 acre plots of land were reserved only for the heads of families. Second provision, the federal government would hold the land in trust for 25 years, meaning that the government would maintain ownership over the land. Why? Because government officials believe that this would prevent Native Americans from selling the land to unscrupulous businessmen. All Indians, the third portion of this Dawes Allotment Act, all Indians would eventually be given land who abandoned their tribal ways. And finally, as part of this, they would receive US citizenship. So the fourth piece and one of the most controversial aspects of the Dawes Allotment Act allowed surplus lands to be sold by the federal government. This will have important ramifications as we'll see in the next slide. But before we get to that, I want to mention this. The Dawes Allotment Act would stay in force until 1934. So almost 50 years, we would see American, Native Americans being stripped of their lands. Yes, they are given 160 acre plots of land, but in return for what? In return for giving up their tribal customs, their tribal ways, and making a living as farmers, very similar to the white yeoman farmers that were at the heart of the Homestead Act in the, 1860s, in the 1860s. And as we can see here, in terms of surplus lands, we see this image on the right hand of the screen, Indian land for sale. Uh, we see a picture of a Native American there, fine lands in the West, irrigated, irrigable, irrigable grazing, agricultural, dry farming. In fact, what we see is in fact, most of these lands that were surplus lands and thus taken away from Native Americans were some of the best lands available. In the end, as I alluded to in the last slide, the Dawes Act did more harm than good for Native Americans. What we see is as a result of the government selling surplus lands, the amount of land presided over by Native Americans declined dramatically. One example of this was the Oklahoma Territory. Remember we talked about how some of the treaties in the 1860s in exchange for giving up their lands in the Great Plains, they were sent down to reservations in Oklahoma. Well, these same reservations would now be torn asunder as a result of the Dawes Act. We can see here in Oklahoma, the map from 1885, just before the Dawes Act, two years before the Dawes Act to 1891 four years after the Dawes Act, where almost a quarter of the territory is now taken away as surplus lands. Furthermore, some of the other pitfalls of the Dawes Act I want to speak about briefly. 
as U.S. citizens, Native American lands were also now taxable. So now Native Americans who were struggling to make a living would have to pay taxes on their lands. Things would also change in terms of what the Allotment Act allowed and did not allow. And what I'm referring to here is the 1906 Burke Act. The 1906 Burke Act. This allowed the federal government to allow Indians to sell their allotted lands before the 25 year trust period came to an end so long as the Native American was deemed competent. Therefore, we see many Native Americans being sort of um, hoodwinked and their lands being sold to these speculators because they were being robbed of them in various ways and connived out of them from these unscrupulous land speculators. Many Indians, however, were willing to sell their land because the land given to them as part of the Dawes Act was poor farming land. Remember, the best lands were left for surplus, far, for surplus sale. Therefore, in sum, all of these problems led to Native Americans living an impoverished life. Native Americans were not the only impediments to westward expansion, but there was also the immigrant. And this comes from Thomas Nast. This political cartoon comes from Thomas Nast, and it appeared in Harper's Weekly in 1870. And what we see is the idea of a wall being built to keep the Chinese immigrants outside of the United States. And this idea of a wall will obviously spring up across U.S. history, including most recently in the 2010s period over the past few years. But here we see it in 1870, this time in relation to the Chinese immigrants seeking entrance to the United States. Let's talk about Chinese immigration here briefly to end this lecture. The Chinese had begun to immigrate to the California and the American West in significant numbers for the first time in the 1850s, primarily seeking gold. This obviously was during the gold rush period. Well, many Chinese laborers worked for the Central Pacific Railroad, which in 1868 had as its workforce 80% Chinese immigrants, or about 12,000. With the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, these Chinese workers needed new jobs, which meant competing with American-born workers. According to the 1880 census, excuse me, the 1880 census, 105,000 Chinese were in the United States. Now here's the thing, 75,000 of these, just under 75%, were in California, and almost all of them were men, and therefore workers looking for jobs in competition with whites. Well, because of the anger, particularly among the white working class, in 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was renewed 10 years later, and then in 1902 became permanent. The Exclusion Act prohibited what it called skilled and unskilled laborers and Chinese employed in mining. So yes, a select few of Chinese were still allowed to continue to arrive in the United States, but not at the level seen previously. In fact, by the 1920 census, the number of Chinese immigrants in the United States had fallen to 60,000. And as we see on the left here, as I referred to earlier, there are some of the Chinese who helped pave the way westward for these transcontinental railroads. But in the end, they were deemed as a threat to the prosperity of the American workers, the white working class, so therefore they were eventually expelled.